Good afternoon. It's Monday the 18th of December 2017, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News, a special UK Column News today because uh, this is the uh, second to last UK Column News that we'll do before the uh, Christmas break. Um, and uh, well, we have some special guests in the studio, Patrick Henningsen, uh, Alex Thompson, uh, Brian Gerrish, and I'm your host, Mike Robinson. And uh, well, we're going to have a look back at the uh, some of the key events of uh, the past year uh, and look forward at what's likely to happen next year. And we're joined uh, by Skype to help us with that uh, by Mark Anderson. So um, we'll get straight on. And uh, well, I'm going to cheat. I was told we were the, the remit was that we had to pick an iconic image or a, a major subject uh, from 2017. But I am cheating slightly. Uh, because uh, I chose uh, the best of both worlds document from David Cameron. And why did I do that? Because this has had uh, relevance right the way through 2017 and is going to have relevance right the way through 2018 as well. So uh, David Cameron uh, published this document, I think, in February 2016. Uh, and it was a new settlement, uh, a new settlement between the UK and the, United, uh, and the, the European Union. Uh, a legally binding agreement at that time, which defined the new relationship uh, between the UK and a reformed European Union. If, if you've been paying close attention, much of the language uh, that was used surrounding this document and within the document uh, in Cameron's time is currently being used by Theresa May and her cabinet today. Uh, they were talking about a special relationship, special status in a reformed European Union. Uh, we have secured a new settlement, he said, to give the United Kingdom special status in the European Union. Uh, our special status gives us the best of both worlds. We will be in parts of Europe that work for us, but we will be out of the parts of Europe that do not work for us. Uh, and uh, well, Brian, Alex, Patrick, uh, I still have not yet received a suitable answer to the question, what is the difference between that position then and the position that we're in today? Whatever the difference is, it seems to have persuaded a lot of Middle England voters, actually, that uh, there is a difference. But uh, increasingly, it's the foreigners who are seeing the difference. Uh, the Continentals, uh, like the Netherlands, where I live, uh, they're asking what the difference was. What has Britain actually achieved by Brexit? What about the states, Pat? Um, uh, well, that's a good question, Alex. I think the states uh, are, um, on the whole, uh, generally, generally clueless. Uh, to everything that goes on in Europe uh, and the UK. So to them, uh, Britain's already left the European Union lock, stock and barrel. Uh, if you speak to most Americans, that's what they think. Uh, as uh, what Mike's pointed out here is the reality uh, is that uh, there is really no difference. Brexit or no Brexit, um, I, I always put out the hashtag uh, Brexit in name only uh, on Twitter. Um, Brexit or no Brexit, whatever that is, uh, as Mike has illustrated here. And what David Cameron laid out in this white paper, um, Brit Britain may end up closer and more integrated with Europe than before. And I want to, yeah. sorry, Brian. Well, I was going to say, in the, in the special new partnership with Europe, this is the key thing. What Theresa May is constantly saying is it's not that we're actually coming away from the uh, European Union supranational state model, which is what 17.4 million voters wanted. Uh, we're actually going to get closer to the model in a new partnership and a new framework. So this is utter deceit from Theresa May, but of course we had utter deceit coming out of the mouth of David Cameron, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, and uh, if we go back to uh, Ted Heath, of course he was the master of the project, in, in as much as the, you know, the, the ultimate deception on people. Absolutely, uh, and uh, well, David Cameron will come back into the discussion later in the programme. Now, uh, one of the We'll come on to EU military unification shortly, Brian. But one of the, the key aspects of EU military unification was that they, they began with uh, a bunch of bilateral agreements on military, uni on military cooperation. Uh, and as that has progressed, they, have mer they are merging these bilateral agreements into an over European wide agreement. Mm -hmm. uh, and one of the key uh, aspects of the Best of Both Worlds document uh, was TTIP. Uh, they featured that in a section in that document where they said this is at the core of British trade policy, TTIP. Now we know that TTIP, it's not really being discussed in the press anymore, it seems to be dead, uh, other, other policies seem to be taking priority over it. Um, but in the meantime, uh, in parallel with, uh, with uh, Brexit, 
uh, Theresa May also launched the hashtag, hashtag Global Britain initiative. Uh, and what Britain is doing is going around the world um, producing or trying to negotiate bilateral trade agreements with quite a number of, of countries around the world. And, and of course, the trade agreement with the European Union is going to be right at the heart of the, uh, of the Brexit uh, arrangements. Um, and my contention is, uh, it's still to be proven, but I'm arguing that um, they intend to pursue a similar uh, template with this. They're going to create bilateral trade agreements with multiple countries. Mm -hmm. And then at some future point, they're going to merge these together to create a TTIP-like arrangement, uh, a TPP-like arrangement. And because they're doing this uh, sort of under the radar, uh, one country versus another, uh, they are, it's, it's not getting the media coverage, it's not getting the, the, uh, the, the detailed analysis the TTIP got. I wonder, Mike, if it's come through in uh, press that you've been following, but the French press, the business press in particular, has been reporting that Britain presented its position last week to Michel Barnier and his negotiating team on behalf of the EU that uh, the Brits had said, the furthest we're prepared to go, our red line in diplomatic parlance, is a CETA-like uh, agreement for the Canadian-European uh, Union agreement, and we, because that has been proven successful to merge a common law with a civil law uh, jurisdiction, we wish to follow a, a similar arrangement for the special relationship that's being developed between Britain and the continent. Well done, Alex. So let's just talk about that and bring Mark Anderson into the programme at this point, because CETA, as you say, is, or CETA plus, as is being described, is what is being uh, suggested if Britain is not prepared to stay within the, uh, the single market and the customs union. Uh, and uh, there was dis much discussion this morning on Radio 4 about whether, uh, whether Britain would stay within the customs union and the single market and whether, excuse me, whether British law would stay in sync uh, with European law or whether it would diverge. And of course, it's going to stay in sync because, you know, both the UK and uh, the European Union have stated that a CETA plus agreement isn't really ideal for either party. So they're not really, they're, they're, kind, of, they're kind of threatening CETA. Uh, there's, there's, it's being used as a weapon, really. It's like but, a WTO, but a bit less threatening. Well, but, but it's, it's being used as a bargaining chip, really. So, so Mark, let me bring you in at this point uh, and say, you know, what are your thoughts on, on CETA? And, I mean, you've been looking into this over the last few days. Uh, how many features of CETA are there that are uh, sort of uh, similar to, to what we might have seen in TPP or TTIP? You know, it's hard to say in, in a lot of detail uh, the answer to your question, Mike. I'm going to be doing some articles for the UK column on CETA and other trade deals, and I'm actually reading bit by bit the entire CETA accord. And it went into effect, according to everything I've read, September 21st of this year, just a little bit ago, of 2017. You know, what's, what struck me is that CETA between Canada and the European Union lists in its preamble all 28 nations of the EU, including Great Britain and Northern Ireland. So as we have to acknowledge, and all of us know this and we've discussed this, Britain is still in the European Union, and CETA treats Britain accordingly. So even while we look at uh, the UK looking at trade deals with the EU, and they're, they're saying that NAFTA, which is being renegotiated under Donald Trump, they're saying that that provides some lessons for Theresa May to learn uh, when she renegotiates or negotiates a trade deal with the EU. But the fact is, is that Britain is still in the EU and CETA treats Britain in that manner. So it's like nothing has changed. Uh, like you were saying at the beginning of the show, Brexit appears to be kind of a shadow boxing thing, almost really just a straw poll of the British electorate with no real binding uh, force behind it. So as I read this whole thing, that's what jumped out at me. I thought I'd find some clause that well, but we had Brexit, so the Britain thing is tentative. The UK thing is tentative in CETA, but uh, they're just part of, of CETA uh, in, in cooperation with Canada. Uh, so that's right in the preamble. That just kind of jumped out at me. There's no, you know, a qualification of the UK status given the Brexit vote. Uh, no, well, so, th that, was, that was the yeah. position of the UK from the beginning, that until the day we leave, if we leave, we are a full member, fully partaking in any in any of the sort of regulations or rules or agreements that are in place. 
uh, and that that will be the case until the day we leave as i say if we leave and of course on the day we leave there are going to be uh terms and conditions surrounding that that leave procedure uh, and we're going to be in some uh, institutions we're going to be out of some institutions there's going to be a trade agreement apparently we don't know exactly what type of trade agreement it's going to be and at that point uh, then of course uh, uh, we would no longer be part of of CETA uh, it, we would be in some other uh, trade agreement and the question then is what happens in the future when these when they when they bring these all together yeah perhaps I can just add to this I think one of the good uh, things that's happened in this whole business mark is that the, the sheer fallacy of any proper parliamentary democratic system running has now been fully exposed. We've got Tony Blair in the uh, mainstream press here in UK today, and, and he's saying that uh, he thinks the most important thing is to get Brexit stopped. It's more important than the next election. Uh, and this really sums it up. We have a former prime minister who's effectively saying to 17.4 million people who voted out of the European Union. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you voted. I don't care what your opinion is. We, the political machinery, are going to tell you what you should think. You got it wrong. We're now going to work to make sure that you stay in the, in the uh, European Union. And of course, exactly the same arrogance is there in the Tory party. David Cameron was full of it. And we've got Theresa May doing the same thing herself. So if, if we want something good that's come out of the whole Brexit uh, debacle, for me, it's the fact we can see there is no longer any form of proper um, democracy working in UK. We're not seeing any proper debate in Parliament on any of these issues. It's, it's generally done by single uh, members of the cabinet going and having private talks. Uh, the public is simply not brought into this. We just get the uh, BBC type propaganda statements telling us what we should believe about Brexit. So are we in a democracy? I don't think we are. That's pretty clear. Uh, voting for a, a different party means you vote for a different colour, but you get the same result. We, we are in a corporate dictatorship. I don't know whether anybody else here would define that in a different term. No, I think that's the right term, Brian. And uh, don't let's forget that in 2000, one of Blair's flunkies put out the statement that the Prime Minister has a vision of a new Britain in which people are appointed to positions of influence. They did, deliberately didn't even say political positions yeah. or civil service positions, but positions of influence. And 17 years later, that Blair vision, with Blair still in the frame, has become reality. Yeah. Any thoughts? Um, no, no. i just echo uh, what Brian said on the uh, corporate side. Um, uh, certainly the fracking uh, issue that's been covered widely on uh, on this network and by Ian R. Crane is a good sort of case study uh, to show um, just how uh, far a corporate, uh, a corporate agenda is superseding uh, any public interest. And also uh, the collusion of government uh, and corporate interests is, by definition, fascism. The closest country on the continent to Britain in many ways is the Netherlands, and people will be aware of Anglo-Dutch corporations such as Royal Dutch Shell and Unilever. Well, actually, in the formation of the latest cabinet, which has kept Mark Rutter on for the third term, a lot of cynical Dutch of all persuasions and none have said that this isn't the Rutter three cabinet. That would be the normal Dutch nomenclature if it's uh, the third time that Rutter chairs a cabinet. They're saying this isn't Rutter three, this is the Shell one cabinet because of the privileged negotiations which the corporations had during what's necessary on the continent, of course, these long rounds of negotiations between many minor parties. This is more hidden in the British system, but it is the equivalent amount of corporate di dictatorship. Um, right. Uh, iconic images, Brian, and we're going to uh, show one of our own iconic images this time, uh, EU military unification. This has been a major story of the year. Uh, major story of the year, Mike, and uh, we've got to say, I'll, <laughs> I'll say first of all, a few people have said, well, occasionally the UK column actually praise their own work. And I'm very proud to do that now because it was the UK column that took the lid off the fact that Britain's military were being cut to the bone, not as a result of financial cuts, but in order to create the model, the right circumstances to leave a British armed forces into a an EU uh, unified military structure. We were warning about this some 10 years ago, well, nine years ago, 
and then it was in 2009, 2010, the UK column alone exposed what was going on in the secret talks carried out by the Franco-British Council. Uh, the key talks uh, took place in the um, residence of the British ambassador in Paris. Military officers took, place, uh, took part in those talks. They didn't wear uniform, they were dressed in lounge suits. I believe this is because the state knew that what this really was was treason. But we had British military officers drawn into the handing away of power. This is sovereignty. Uh, this is this is, uh, addresses constitutional issues. But of course, ultimately, it was handing away uh, Britain's military into this unified um, EU structure. And what have we seen bursting into the uh, press over the last uh, few months as a result of exposure? Um, by UK column. David Ellis, Strategic Defence Initiatives, of course, done a huge amount of research showing that the British government absolutely lying, the cuts to Britain's military, nothing to do with uh, financial cuts or financial measures. This was to create the right climate for this uh, EU military unification. And it's still proceeding. So Theresa May, at one hand, talking to the British public, saying we're coming out. But behind the scenes, she is meeting or she's sending a representative, Boris Johnson being a key one, of course, um, linking Britain into this EU system. And what does that system need? Well, it needs an EU treasury. That's now coming. It, it, it needs an EU military procurement structure. That's coming. And it needs the EU forces to be fully integrated so that we don't have, for example, just a Dutch unit working alongside the Germans. We actually have a Dutch unit under the full control, command and control of a German unit. And exactly the same thing is going on with the, with the British. So we are in a, a perilous situation at the moment as Lee Rotherham, the uh, expert from Veterans for Britain, has so accurately said, the moment a nation loses control of their own military, you cease to exist as a nation, and we're on that knife edge. Uh, so so uh, last week, two very important, you've just mentioned, uh, procurement, uh, that was announced, that new procure procurement arrangement was announced last week at the European Council. Uh, Treasury, of course, we had announced in October uh, uh, that, that they were working towards that. Um, so, you know, everything that, all the ticks are in the boxes now and uh, they're moving ahead very quickly with it. Now, uh, before, sorry, Alex, just before I ask you to comment, Patrick, I'd get, like to get a comment from you on this because, um, you know, people that, that watch this program uh, that are perhaps uh, of an anti-war mindset, um, as we are, everybody here is, um, but they sometimes don't quite understand why we are focusing so much on the British military uh, and on the British uh, arms industry and so on, um, and why we are so why we feel it's important that that stays in the command and control of the British government. Um, but one of the things that really concerns me most about what's being created here, um, because we had Jens Stoltenberg last week uh, saying on a number of occasions, including at the European Council meeting, uh, that what European military unification will do is not duplicate any NATO structures, it's going to create com complementary structures. In other words, they're going to they're going to fit together like this. Mm -hmm. Right. So so what we're creating is is a massive military power block, um, which is I don't think it's quite to the level of the United States, but it's it's certainly going to be something which could operate autonomously and perhaps operate autonomously of the Security Council. Um, yeah, absolutely. I think it comes down to uh, one simple concept. Uh, whether you're uh, for or against uh, uh, military uh, build-ups, military budgets within the country, uh, this is a buy-in-the-buy -buy argument. What's important is accountability. And if, it's, if you live in a country and it's, it's a military that is under the command and control of your government, uh, then you have a line of accountability right up from the military through the government to you as the electorate. Um, when that is handed over uh, in a European federal mm -hmm. or super state, that's no longer the case anymore. And then in the United States of Europe, uh, you have about as much say uh, in the uh, defense spending, 
uh, in foreign policy intervention decisions uh, as someone in the state of uh, Arizona has against Washington, D.C., mm. or the Pentagon. And this is what a future arrangement will look like uh, between European member states uh, and Brussels, and it will be like this. Uh, not only that, we're in, in EU unified military force will be the second, it will be the second largest expenditure in the world behind the United States. Eventually, this is where it will be. So it will be on par uh, with the U.S. Uh, in that sort of power arrangement. And, and I'm going to say this is going to radically transform uh, the balance of power, uh, it, potentially in the U.N. Security Council uh, and geopolitically. So you have a whole other set of issues that are going to come from this. Uh, and it, the, 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 the tension that could be created from this between China, Russia, Europe, and the United States, and all these countries' various allies, uh, is unfor it's unknown. It's unknown what's that, what that's going to look like. Yeah, but the anti-war movement really needs to pay attention to this. They do. And, and PESCO is an important concept. And I said on the show last week, I said PESCO, not to be confused with Tesco, uh, because it is a military supermarket. Mm -hmm. And the dominant player in this European military supermarket is going to be U.S. defense contractors. Yeah. Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, General Dynamics, General Electric, and the list goes on. These will be the dominant transnational corporations, they will set the agenda. They'll set the foreign policy agenda. They will set the geopolitical agenda, as they're doing with NATO today, as they're doing with the Pentagon today. This will be the destiny of Brussels if it comes to pass. To echo and reinforce your points there, Pat, Jacques Chirac, who in 1998 forced the uh, British under Blair into the French vision, which had gone on for decades by then of U EU military union through the Saint-Malo agreement. He, in his own presidency, like a lot of French presidents before him, said, oh, no, no, there's no danger that I will ever, as French president, become like the governor of Idaho. He used the, the exam example you've given. Macron came up through the banks, and he has uh, transformed that um, French drive to, to control through uh, superior officership and whatever, to control the EU and make it into a, a francophone side or a, a French style state. He's, he's made that reality and the France, France is particularly interested in fiddling with the Near East and the Arab world. That's competing against the German desire to uh, at least hermetically seal off what they can of the continent, including the Brits' money at least and their troops, and uh, put up a wall against Russia. That's not the German people's desire. But these are the two um, fighting uh, elements at the heart of the EU military union, plus the Anglos and the Zionists. They're always in the background there. Uh, if when we uh, Brian has here on his lap the EU military unification timeline, which sure. is a landing page. We're about to double the that. length of that, uh, corroborating exactly what Pat's just saying with examples from the 1950s and 60s of U.S. contract, U.S. based global uh, defense contractors hollowing out and killing British industry, as David Ellis has been saying, for this. So it's a very dirty and complex game. Uh, EU military, unif military unification has been dreamed up by several competing cabals behind the scenes. It serves the interests of all of them. And in the end, uh, if Europe has, has been uh, roped into it, the 2% of GDP spent on the military will just be a starting figure. And if the EU becomes, for the main global cabals or main quarters of the cabal, uh, the, the, new, uh, the basis of the new world army, then they're going to be uh, massively increased spending on that, perhaps up to 20-30% of GDP. So individually people are going to be taxed up to 70% to fund this because that will be the new army intervening, uh, protecting Israel and intervening in Africa and Asia in the way that the US under President Trump may no longer reliably do. So that's why it's of interest to people of all political persuasions. And, and, and just one last question. I'll throw this over to, to Mike So and Brian, too. Br Britain has spent uh, so much of its time and energy over the um, uh, centuries keeping Europe from uh, having a unified uh, military or uh, power structure in continental Europe. Um, wh why would it be in the, how do we know that Britain is not going to sabotage to be like yes minister scenario to be inside to break it up from the inside or is this britain taking a new step to join the continent what is what is actually happening here well what what i think is is becoming clear here is that we've got to start to look at actually who we are as a nation and who is governing us and for me it's becoming very clear that the people governing us the political establishment to give it a fairly broad title these are people whose views, values and ideology is not part of this nation state. 
So they are prepared to sacrifice Britain's armed forces, very, very dirty things going on inside Britain's armed forces at the moment, creating a broken defence arrangement. Um, but they're doing that whilst they're putting together the European super state. Why can they do that? Because the people governing this country at the moment are not British in any general sense of the word. Their ideology, their morality, their belief structure is, is something different. And I think we need to start having a real look at this. Of course, it's going to take us on who pulls their strings. That's going to link into who controls the money and the banks. And then we can start to see how the power really plays out. But for me, the end of, of 2017 is the point at which I think we can see what we've regarded as traditional politics with parties and voting in a different party and a different prime minister. This is complete nonsense. We've got to look at the really deep state drivers of this agenda. A closing thought on this uh, is that it looks like Mark wants to come in, uh, but just uh, with an eye on the time, um, people will be pleased to know that after David Ellis has, usu as usual, analysed things perfectly and played a blinder by going public with his submission, which was being frustrated by someone in the machinery, we now have had a contact on Friday from the clerks saying... Of the, oh, sorry, of the, of defense, the defense Committee, committee I beg your yeah. pardon, saying, Dear Mr Ellis, yes, uh, Dr Lewis, the Chairman of the Defence Committee of the House of Commons, has finally become aware of your submission. The original paper copy has gone walkies. Someone didn't want him to see it, but he's become aware of it, presumably through watching and reading UK column or being tipped off. And we are now to submit it formally this afternoon. Afternoon, That's my editing job this afternoon. We have been positively invited by the Patriots, uh, it, led by Dr Julian Lewis, is the MP who chairs the committee, to submit that evidence so that they're on sp uh, up to speed. And the Defence Committee is particularly concerned now about the hollowing out of British defence industry, which is Mr Ellis's key point. So that's a real result this year. Um, so, Mark, uh, what are your thoughts on this? And, and I'm interested because you're the only one of the four that's actually living in the United States full time at the moment. I'm interested to know, is there any awareness of any of what we've been talking about in the US or coverage of it in the US press? Not really. You know, the Alex Joneses of the world, the alternative media don't get into it much. American Free Press and my blog, of course, do somewhat. Uh, like Patrick alluded to earlier, uh, it's pretty thin uh, when he was re uh, remarking that Americans think that Brexit's a done deal when we know it was little more than a straw poll. Um, I wanted to add, just to put a capstone on what you were saying, that uh, this is definitely the imprint of the Bilderberg Group, among other think tanks and groups, of course, but the Bilderberg Group, Joseph Redinger, the Kalergi Plan, going back to right after World War II and CIA money being used to start the Bilderberg Group. Right then, even then, they were talking about the concept of the United States of Europe. We're, we're seeing here as 2017 wraps up, we're seeing the consummation of that. And when you talk about the deep state, as Brian talked about, and, and really getting to who pulls the strings, Americans, you know, and many Europeans and Brits too, you know, they're very naive, even the more informed ones. They, they can't relate to people in the power structure that think in terms of decades. These people think in terms of centuries, while most of us think in terms of what am I going to eat today, what am I going to do tomorrow, next week, next month at the most. You know, we're dealing with people that are very focused on the long-range plan, and we have to learn to think like that and get into their mode of thinking to anticipate what they're doing. But I think we're reading the proverbial tea leaves pretty accurately here. A lot of our predictions and uh, opinions are coming true, uh, at least for the most part. And uh, we're seeing who's pulling the strings. We're seeing what they're doing and where they're going. Um, I would even add that when Donald Trump spoke about uh, each European country paying up its, its uh, proper amount of money to pay for European defense, when I was reading a Euromill article yesterday, that's that website Euro MIL, as in European military, it appears to be the official website of the European Union regarding its military. It was saying that when Donald Trump spoke about everybody paying their fair share in Europe, that that seemed to strengthen PESCO and accelerate everything uh, to bring about a more multilateral, unified uh, European army with uh, a what they describe as a stronger European pillar 
within the NATO and European military establishment. So whether Donald Trump intended it or not is not known, but it seems like all his talk about everybody paying their fair share for the European military and anteing up more money, it seems like that went on to strengthen the European army movement, uh, you know, uh, in tandem with NATO, working independently uh, or alongside NATO, as you guys are describing. Whether that was Trump's intent or not, I don't know, but uh, it's possible that uh, that was a rhetorical thing uh, to uh, actually accelerate what we're talking about with the European military. It, it's hard to say at this point. Uh, no, Mark, Mark, but, I, Mark um, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that, uh, I mean, Patrick and I were doing the, doing the news together. Uh, the day that Trump made that, it was the inaugur it was the inauguration of the new NATO headquarters in Brussels, oh. uh, and Trump made that statement, and and we discussed it, and we said it was like he was like a mafia boss, it was like a protection racket he was offering here. It was a th it, it was it was quite a, a quite a statement and quite a threat. He said, "Get on with this and stop messing about." So you're absolutely right with that. But to to, to come back to Patrick's question about uh, you know British policy always being in the past to break up the Europe from the inside. And now we're seeing British policy to bring Europe together. It seems or at least British policy in bed with that idea. Um, perhaps well, uh, perhaps this gives us a clue, uh, Patrick, because this uh, is your image from last night's Sunday War. And in here we have uh, President Putin and Poroshenko with his head in his hands and also uh, Mr. Saakashvili with his head in his hands. Uh, and, uh, and alongside that, Patrick, I think we need to to bring the current edition of Newsweek, uh, because this is an iconic uh, front page. It is spectacular. And when we look forward to 2018, uh, well, Newsweek is looking forward to 2018 and openly discussing World War III. And so I'm going to throw the question right back at you, Patrick, and say, um, uh, is Britain behind the unification of Europe because they are preparing for exactly that? Well, if you want to talk about uh, a move that could escalate um, geopolitical tensions to a whole other level, uh, one of those would be European military unification and the European superstate. Um, this would up the ante, as it were, and it was almost begging for some sort of an outcome uh, to happen on uh, Europe's um, eastern front and Russia's western front. And we have a number of uh, contentious uh, regions there, including the Ukraine. And uh, as we speak, uh, uh, Misha Saakashvili is uh, um, causing chaos in the Ukraine. Uh, and it's, it's, inc it's an incredible story. I mean, it is one of the most incredible, um, tragic, comic, uh, bizarre, uh, you'd love to be a gonzo uh, stenographer on that road show right now because it's like nothing we've ever seen. I've seen the YouTube videos of him busting through the border uh, uh, of the Ukraine and busting out, having his mob bust him out of jail. Meanwhile, behind the scenes, the United States government, John McCain, people like this are very much, uh, uh, I, I think personally, um, I think he's there on the orders of the U.S. And I think uh, there are plans for the Ukraine. We were discussing this with, uh, with Alex before the show. There's a lot of moving parts there. Um, how things settle and where they settle. Uh, is yet to be determined, but um, to to think that uh, the United States and uh, NATO or the EU have given up uh, on the basket case uh, of an economy and a country known as the Ukraine uh, is far from the truth. They haven't given up at all. There's a number of other uh, contingencies that are in motion right now. Alex, uh, you know, over the as we've discussed the Ukraine and and particularly Saakashvili's uh, recent role there, mm -hmm. uh, we've been speculating that perhaps he's been uh, let go by his supporters, Soros and, and McCain and so on. But recent, the last couple of days, recent events seem to be demonstrating that, no, actually, they're, they're still there right yeah. behind him. Never underestimate this man. Um, I love your coining of a phrase there, Pat. I was Her Majesty's gonzo stenographer for Mikhail Saakashvili for six years of my life. And um, that's where I got many of my insights, actually. Uh, it nearly did me in, but it, what doesn't kill us will make us stronger, as they say. Entertaining. Though. Absolutely. So um, this man is uh, mercurial. His, his great weakness, Saakashvili, is his, in, in his wish to indulge his appetites daily for food, sex, and public acclaim. And what uh, defines the three men there, the, the, um, the current presidents of uh, the Russian Federation and Ukraine, Putin and Poroshenko, and also the former uh, president of, Saka, uh, of Georgia, now stateless person, um, have mob will travel, Saakashvili. What sets this triad, uh, uh, triad apart 
is that all three were approached by uh, what's going to be, I think, one of our major in-depth themes for 2018, which is uh, a series of, of criminal cabals. And we mean actually criminals running government behind the scenes. They have many co uh, points of commonality with the mafia. All three were appro approached in the 90s. Um, I can't say too much publicly, but they, uh, there are some good books even um, about how this happened. And it nearly killed all of them. But uh, the Georgian and Ukrainian uh, gentlemen here decided to go to get in bed with the cabal. And uh, if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. They, they will eventually, but after a long and, and agonizing um, uh, evening of their political lives, they'll be dispatched when they're no longer needed. Putin wrestled with these demons uh, early on. Uh, he, he, he did have some kind of dirty compromise with them around 94. Uh, the best evidence has come from uh, former MI6 officer Tomlinson, particular, Richard Tomlinson, particularly as elaborated in, da in Daniel Estulin's book on Tavistock. Um, it's, it's clear that some people like Brendan O'Connell, now festering in a New Zealand jail, have gone further and said that, that Putin actually cut a dirty deal. He's in with all the secret societies. I do not believe that. Uh, I think his intentions are right. He dealt in the 2000s with the dirty British-backed oligarchs, the same cabal, uh, unfortunately a largely Jewish-based mafia with many tentacles in London and many bolt holes in around the home counties. Uh, he dealt with them in the 2000s and now he feels strong enough in this decade, uh, starting with Kosovo and South Ossetia and uh, all those geopolitical turning points around 2008, to actually say Russia's not playing this game anymore. That is the difference, really. Putin, I think, will survive to the end of his political career intact. Uh, I wouldn't say with clean hands. I don't think you can be president of the Russian Federation and have clean hands. I'm not naive. Uh, but he is uh, going to succeed as long as he wishes in his vision because the people are behind him. The Ukrainian and Georgian peoples are, are ethnically and religiously, religiously split more than even the Russians these days. Putin has united the, the strands of the Russian Federation during his tenure. Saakashvili and Poroshenko have uh, divided their own peoples to the point of bloody civil war repeatedly, for some, which is something for which, when it happened in England, we chopped off King Charles's head after he launched his second war of aggression against his own parliament and people. So this is a big theme for 2018, and it only makes sense if you understand cabals behind the nations. And I just want to add to that, you know, the big story in terms of the EU and Britain and the United States have laid uh, economic sanctions against Russia, uh, presumably over the uh, annexation of Crimea or the downing of MH17. I don't want to get in too much into the details on those. It's a separate uh, show, perhaps. But what's important is you talked about what Putin's leadership or what the Russian government has done uh, after sanctions have been imposed on them. Um, unfortunately, there are people in Westminster and people in Washington that are absolutely clueless to the fact that Russia right now, his GDP growth is in line with the EU, Russian inflation at 2% in line with the EU. Russia is now the world's largest grain exporter. The Russian agricultural sector is now number two. It's knocking on the door of the defense export industry. Uh, it's 12% of their GDP growth, agriculture. They've had a boom in agriculture. Money has come back because of sanctions. Money has come back to Russia. Uh, there's plenty of money for corporate and business loans. Uh, it's, it's been an explosion. There's people in Russia that don't want sanctions to end right now. Mm -hmm. It's been fantastic. So in this sense, uh, Putin, the Russian leadership, the country has come together and you could say um, has have pulled a blinder on the West. And there's still people uh, in, in our governments that are absolutely oblivious to this fact. Mm -hmm. Russia is now signing deals with China, billion dollar deals guaranteeing uh, supplies of gas. The Nord Stream pipeline is, has been agreed by European countries. It's, it's moving forward. Ukraine is still uh, buying Russian gas. What have we achieved with our foreign policy? And I would say we've done a great job in building uh, <laughs> Russia up, actually. And had they, had they dropped these sanctions, you might disagree or agree with this, uh, Alex, had this happened 15 years ago, it might have been a different result. But the Russian economy is much more diverse now. Uh, and the, there's a resilience in the economy that wasn't there before. That is, I, I think it's Poor, poor, poor analysts, uh, people who have, are, are reading briefing papers that are thinking Yeltsin is still hmm. running around in Moscow, this, that's not Russia anymore. And I think the gross underestimation on behalf of uh, the advisors to our governments in the U.S. and the U.K., they have completely missed the mark.
All the documentaries about Russia that are being produced this year show Norilsk, the most polluted city in the world, belching out its fumes and so on, and people coughing their guts out, poor life expectancy. What we don't get is documentaries about Russia's massive growth in pharmaceutical and automotive manufacturing through the whole of its previously depressed central rust belt that used to vote communist for Gennady Zuganov. They're behind Putin now, including the uh, Muslim Tatar peoples and the other peoples of Russia. They uh, understand Russia's uh, economic position. Um, Last night I was with Brian and I saw that his uh, drinking glasses at home have Made in Russia stamped on the bottom. Surprised both of us. It did. It surprised me. (laughs) And uh, last month I interpreted for some uh, Chinese clients demonstrating some high-tech equipment to the Dutch. And uh, halfway through, the Chinese gentleman said, because China has built a railway through Russia and with a north-south branch, which goes from Finland to Iran, so to the Gulf Coast, we now think it's more sensible to send our designs to Russia to be assembled because of the intelligent and and motivated workforce. And this kit can roll into Europe and even be exported to the United States from European ports. The Dutch uh, are quite happy for the Chinese and Russians to own this infrastructure including the port of Rotterdam now, the Europort, and they are completely being sealed in willingly to the positive model which Eurasia offers. Uh, the Anglo-American uh, currency model which they've been in until now and the, uh, the military backing for it is a busted flush, as we've been discussing with EU military unification. Russia should never be underestimated. Okay, well, we better move on uh, to the final sort of topic here. Uh, and, uh, well, Patrick, uh, you've given us this image. Uh, and, of course, this has kind of begun with the the fake news agenda. It's now moved on because of the amount of fake news that the the likes of the four of us and and Mark are pushing out. Uh, We've got to to censor that fake news uh, and we've got to promote uh, the mainstream media as much as possible. We've got to create trust groups, trust organizations. uh, And uh, so this certainly has been developing uh, uh, throughout 2017, but this is going to be a big story in 2018 uh, as we find that, uh, well, we can't use social media anymore uh, as a mechanism of uh, passing on what's going on around around the world. Yeah, it's, it's, it is a big issue, Mike. Um, you know, these are U.S. corporations uh, originally based in the Silicon Valley. Some of them have got seed funding from InQtel, uh, which is a CIA front company. That's a, a side story. But the main story is what do we have now? Powerful, uh, highly capitalized, big multinational corporations, Google, Facebook, uh, Twitter, and others that essentially have a digital monopoly, not just in America, and wh- where something like antitrust might come into play, or even in Europe. This is a global monopoly, 95% market share worldwide, discounting uh, China. China yeah. We'll put that off to the side, the great uh, uh, firewall, uh, and maybe Russia too in some respects because they have their own alternatives. But that's you know, a 90 95% global market share. And so that's an incredible amount of power to be given in the hands of a few people that have already proven themselves to be absolute ideologues on one side of the political spectrum, okay? And so they're making decisions of what information that you and I and everybody out there is allowed to see first when they put search terms into Google or when they post something on Facebook. I post things on Facebook. I have uh, 30, 40,000 followers um, and only uh, 900 are seeing it, okay? This is uh, throttling. This is what Facebook does. Twitter will eventually, I think, get well, on board. It is board. doing it. It is They're doing, doing it, it without now. any question. Yeah. And Google is absolutely doing it. This has been even admitted in articles in the New York Times. This affects the UK column. It affects 21st Century Wire. It affects Consortium News. It affects GlobalResearch.ca and uh, Antiwar.com. And many, uh, many of the, the websites and news sources that are being affected by this, I've noticed the correlation that I've seen. It's not to do with uh, political left or right. Um, it's to do with opposing military interventions, mainly, or the rampant military-industrial complex adventurism. Those seem to be the sites. Anybody questioning that or Syria or questioning uh, the the false uh, dialectic that's been constructed between uh, the West and Russia, these are the sites that are being attacked, either as Kremlin agents uh, or fake news. Uh, And we just happened to... My website happened to oppose uh, Hillary Clinton on the basis of her record as Secretary of State 
uh, as a potential disaster from a foreign policy point of view. But yet we were we were characterized uh, by some of the people who supply the uh, database uh, references that Google will go off of these various fake news lists. Uh, we've been called right wing or we've been called uh, conspiracy or all these things. And the reality is we are none of the above. And I'm just in a small independent operation. And so this is the future. This is too much power to be had in the hands of a few people uh, in charge of what should be a public utility by now. Yeah. Okay. What, what does Mark say? Well, I, I was gonna, I was gonna yeah. say to Mark, look, uh, because because Google is taking this position, Facebook as well. I mean, we can't we can't rule out the other social media, uh, but Google being uh, also the the source of organic search uh, and also the biggest video sharing site on the planet and this kind of thing, really important player. But of course, Google's not shy of getting involved in other uh, uh, political policy discussions. For example, tax. Oh, you're referring to the uh, the uh, uh, offshore taxation. Well, exactly, and and the, and the whole uh, Googleberg situation. Uh, so you know that they are they are playing in a in a global policy field, uh, and uh, at the same time that they're supposed to be providing a public service, and this to me is is something pretty dangerous. Oh yeah, you're you're referring, of course, uh, for the audience to refresh everyone's memory, going back to 2013 when there was that unusual Googleberg meeting uh, in Watford uh, at the same hotel where Bilderberg met shortly thereafter, um, and we talked then about the fact that they would scream about uh, corporations hiding their money in offshore havens, and that they would make a lot of political hay out of that. But what they were really getting at was. They wanted to create a global IRS, a global tax regime where no one would be safe. And w what it would actually do is be used to take out competitors. They would use the tax law eventually to, to, uh, to squeeze out competitors and clear the uh, market field for the biggies like, like Google and others. And that's the usual thing. When the IRS was created in the United States, the same kind of thing took place. We were told the IRS, uh, the, the federal income tax, the 16th Amendment, would only tax the super rich. That's what got the people behind it. Let's get the gilded, uh, the gilded class. Let's get them. Let's get the super rich. Let's get the Morgans or the Rockefellers. But soon thereafter, the U.S. federal income tax was retrofitted to tax where even $600 now must be reported. Technically, if you make $600 or more in the U.S., you're supposed to file an income tax. So... Um, a similar pattern uh, could, can be expected with a global tax with the, uh, you know, the offshore havens and the Panama Papers simply being used as the excuse to build the global tax regime so, so no one can escape, can escape the tax man. So, uh, yeah, we're just kind of uh, refreshing what we talked about then at Bilderberg, and we've talked about it since then, but it's good that you brought that up, Mike. So we're square on that as 2017 draws to a close. Thoughts? Well, I, I just come back to government. And of course, we saw a couple of years ago that uh, David Cameron was in bed, so to speak, with Google. So um, the godmother of his uh, son, I think, was uh, the um, Google president for Europe. I think I've got that position right. Uh, but here we, it's, fine, it's very difficult now to separate governments from this uh, immensely powerful corporate structure. Uh, with Google, in principle, we're looking at information, power around information and information exchange. Uh, but behind the scenes, as Patrick has, uh, has spoken about, we've got these immensely powerful military um, industrial complex groups that are simply having closed door meetings with our politicians. And until we get the lid off this stuff and expose what these people are really doing behind closed doors, of course, we can't get to grips with the real things we should be talking about, which are much more basic. It's to do with have people got houses? Have they got homes to live in? Have they got jobs? Are their medical needs looked after? Are their children, uh, uh, have their children got proper access to education? All the troubles of UK at the moment, or the USA, or indeed individual nation states in Europe, those basic needs are not being addressed because we're being run by a political elite who are busy, as you say, Mark, planning in terms of centuries to get world power, mm. world control. But until we get the lid off how these people, sorry, who these people are and how they're doing it, 
uh, we cannot get the focus back onto living lives in a proper, um, kind, loving, humane way, and that should be the focus. Um, Alex, uh, just to end this section, what what do you think? Uh, what has changed in the relationship between corporations and government that uh, we had David Cameron making a speech in the United Nations a couple of years ago, uh, warning the world apparently of uh, domestic extremism and people that are not following the government narrative and that that's got to be dealt with. Uh, and then some time passes uh, and then we have Theresa May uh, calling Google and Facebook and Twitter into number 10 and requiring them to take action on the, on the fake news situation as they, as they presented it. Uh, and, and then from a PR point of view, it's being presented as Theresa May giving instructions to global corporations and then global corporations carrying out the will of the British government. What, what has changed in, in recent years about, about the relationship between government and corporations that that scenario is even possible? Well, as all our contributors just said, government and corporations are but two fronts for the same kinds of cabals to have their uh, wish implemented. And so the difference is that we used to, until Cameron, who was the last one born to rule, um, we used to have uh, at least fake statesmen, but they were statesmen trained at Oxbridge, and they could put a good front on things. And so they could carry off the idea that uh, that corporations were good chaps and uh, you know suitably to be dealt with. Theresa May is the first of these nervous shell-type characters to have taken over, so she's uh, really very much directly controlled. Some of her political advisers and those of her ministers have come straight from banks and foundations at a very young age. Uh, after being uh, having been proven for their ability to be good operators. And so they are telling Mrs May now, who's nervous and doesn't have any idea of how to bear herself, comport herself in public, This you need to be seen to be taking a tough hand with Europe. You need to be seen to be taking a tough hand with the corporations. It's a boodle and coodle show, as uh, Daniel Hannan would call it, or a box and cox. You know. They're both glove puffets, both the government model and the corporation model. I should say the party political model and the corporation model. They're both glove puffets for the old criminal elite bloodline families. But the difference is, Mike, that it's no longer convincing to the British and other uh, waking up uh, populations that to, it's no longer credible by any stretch of the imagination to think that governments are controlling this because we can see what doofuses our government uh, is, 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 consists of. So the only strategy is for those whom we're losing faith in to be seen to be getting tough it's a good cop, bad cop routine. Mm -hmm. um, there's many tentacles to this. Able danger, Field McConnell and David Hawkins have narrowed in on the fact that Serco, a British globalist corporation, controls the US Patents Office. If you follow that through, you should look at American Intelligence Media, AIMfortruth.org, number four in there. And if you click on the images on their website, you'll see long timelines of how Google and particularly Facebook were set up very much by these cabals using what Patrick referred to, InQtel, uh, a, a quiet CIA front which sucks in uh, intellectual property. So uh, the, 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 the cabals are interested in intellectual property. That's why technology is such a big attender and also uh, transhumanism. But they do so uh, by hoovering up what's existing there and by having control networks. So in short, the, 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 the parties um, are no longer as convincing as they used to be. Uh, and people had already lost trust in the corporations. They were the even badder, even worse side of the equation in the public consciousness. So the only strategy now left to the cabal is to have the supposedly um, less evil side or, or, or uh, the, the, the side that we think have less thoughts in their heads get tough with the, the corporations because in the public mind, the corporations are beyond the pale, beyond redemption now. Just uh, final thoughts, Patrick. Yeah, my final thoughts is just to bring this, uh, bring this home, this issue home. Um, how many times have we seen... Uh, our government leaders insist that the number one threat is terrorism, is uh, Islamic terrorism, or is ISIS, or whatever. Okay, this winter, this Christmas, how many people? Well, we don't. We hope none uh, are, are going to fall prey to the menace of ISIS. But how many are going to die because of fuel poverty? Mm. Pensioners that are living on a, an obscene, obscene amount of money, low amount of money, paying exorbitant gas prices, uh, extortionate prices, being taxed to the hilt by their local authorities. I mean, there are more people that are going to perish in this holiday season because of those things. So what is the real threat if you draw up the national threat matrix? Mm. Is it... Uh, uh, some wild uh, guy driving onto the pavement in Westminster, or is it a system that is so pernicious 
that has pushed uh, people into the margins to such a degree they can't even afford to heat their house in the winter. This is a reality today in this country and in other countries uh, in, as well. Okay, uh, right. One liner just to respond to the chat room there. What difficulties have the UK column team mostly encountered this year? Public lethargy and refusal to believe what we've been saying right now. I think that's right. Okay, well, look, we're, we're out of time, folks. So, uh, Patrick, uh, what are your thoughts for 2018? Are you optimistic or pessimistic? What, what are your uh, thoughts? Well, well, I'm very optimistic, and I want to say congratulations um, to the, uh, the UK column uh, for driving a, a news story um, into the national news cycle this year. Uh, and this goes to show what we can do with a very little financial resources, uh, with a lot of cooperation, a lot of help, a lot of sweat equity. Uh, and also, uh, congratulations to 21st Century Wire, to Vanessa Bealey for driving a story into the national news cycle. Uh, and so in the case of the UK column, it is uh, EU military unification. Uh, in the case of 21st Century Wire, it was uh, the British uh, Foreign Office's uh, conflict instability slush fund uh, uh, pumping money to uh, jihadist and terrorist affiliates uh, in Syria. Uh, and thanks to the uh, great work of Vanessa Bealey uh, and also my small role in that story as well and uh, her colleagues. So um, this goes to show that uh, we can make a difference in independent media, uh, e even with limited resources, but of course we do need help. Uh, so I'll leave that uh, end of things to you. Um, so same question to you, Mark. What are your thoughts for 2018? Are you uh, optimistic or pessimistic about what's coming? Uh, cautiously optimistic. Uh, I echo Patrick. Uh, Vanessa getting to the Geneva Press Club and breaking through that censorship and getting that message out into the so-called mainstream avenues was a major breakthrough. Maybe we can see more of that. Maybe one of you guys could address the Geneva Press Club sometime about the military unification issue or other issues. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that, like Patrick said, with the information systems needing to become much more like a public utility, that that, that will mean the news media itself, as well as the blogosphere, as well as the creation of money, the monetary system should be more like a public utility and the control of our military. It's really a matter of controlling money, military, and information, and restoring sufficient sovereignty to each nation. Uh, that's a lot of the themes that we can go after, among others. But I'm very cautiously but very optimistic that as we network together in our news work, as we cross-pollinate to a reasonable degree, that we can continue like we did as 2017 is wrapping up, we can continue to break through the wall of censorship and suppression and make more of a difference, even more than we did this year. So I think we're going to see a banner year in 2018 as long as we work hard. Absolutely. Alex? I think that uh, the main thing is that we're going to see uh, people coming across to us from the mainstream. And I'm, I'm talking now about serious mainstream journalists, uh, serious people who've been in political parties or in government or in the civil service. Uh, we're sensing the foreshocks of that now. We're getting to that crucial tipping point uh, you know how the uh, the curvature of the earth, which I'm going to get shot for for saying now, <laughs> is such that when you're at the British latitudes, uh, one degree of latitude makes a huge amount of difference. So that when it's gloomy in David Scott's own uh, hometown of Perth, it's sunny down here in Plymouth. Yeah, uh, And a huge difference in public mood as a result of that. Well, I think we're on that tipping point of the curvature now in talking to Middle England, which I'll make no apologies for saying these, these are the strategically most important people. They're, they're not worthier than the, the, uh, the lower classes, the, the working classes and the underclass, but they are much more important as opinion formers because they have the cushy jobs in the UK and EU government structures. These people are personally now being affected by child theft, home theft, uh, outsourcing of their jobs and various other horrors, sexualization of their children. And uh, I think we're now at the point where many of them are starting to defect to us. Uh, they may be like Nicodemus in John chapter 3, coming to us in the dead of night the fear of the authorities, uh, but we are actually going to see these defections. We're ready for them. We're ready to give them appropriate platforms. You've got nothing to fear. We are gentlemen. Brian. Um, I don't need that, of you course. Sorry. Uh, what would I say about this year? I think we've made huge progress, and I think the fact that we're seeing the political system have to introduce censorship says that uh, the information that we, uh, as a broad 
group of uh, alternative media, what we've been pushing out has been um, accurate, it's been powerful, it's been so powerful, the state is now having to react to us. So every time you see another attempt at more censorship, more control of the press and the media and the internet, uh, that is a signal that the truth does the damage. So we've got to keep pushing out more truth. And I'm going to say that uh, many people in the chat box at the moment are saying how nice it is to see this format of, of uh, pr uh, program today. So we're here as a group. There's some discussion. We would like to do a lot more of this. Mm -hmm. We can only do that with more financial support from our audience. We're going to be talking more about this next year, uh, but if we're really to get the lid off what's happening, we have to have uh, more um, news coming out. We have to have more analytical and investigatory programs coming out. We can do this, but we can only do it with uh, additional support from our audience. And although a couple of people have poked me very gently for perhaps being a bit uh, strong, uh, with saying that if the people who currently view UK Column and don't pay any form of subscription, if just 10% of those people would start to take out subscriptions or make a regular donation, then we are capable of making a significant and uh, I think very, very important improvement to the news and documentary information that we're pushing out. But having said that, we can only do it with the assistance of other people. So Patrick, thank you very much for all your effort. Uh, uh, of course, Alex, yourself, and Mark, it's always nice to have you coming in from the States. 2018, we're into the battle. It is going to get tough. We are going to see, I think, some very um, upsetting things happening both in UK and Europe and uh, elsewhere in the world, because that's what the system wants to drive fear, angst, strife, war. Uh, but if people stay together and they do the right thing, they tell the truth, they uh, stick to morality, I think we can turn it around. OK, well, I think on that note, we will end. And uh, I will echo that. Thank you very much, gentlemen and Mark, for, for joining us today. And thank you for joining us today. Uh, Brian and I will be here for the, uh, the final uh, UK column news of 2017 tomorrow. Uh, and we will be back on uh, Wednesday, the 3rd of January. But uh, join us at 1 p.m. tomorrow. Uh, thank you for your support in 2017, and we look forward to 2018. Uh, but in the meantime, we'll see you tomorrow. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.